Hey there, welcome to a brand new episode of Music Express. My name is Twan and in this week's vlog you will see my interview with Sean Evans in which she tells the story behind the Cochine classic Hide You. But before we start with the interview, please make sure to subscribe to my channel and very important, also make sure to click the bell button because then you will get a notification the next time a new vlog is online. Alright, here it is, the story behind Cochine's Hide You my interview with Sean Evans. Enjoy! Sean Evans is a Welsh singer and songwriter who already started her love for music at an early age. At the end of the 90s she met up with Mark Morrison and Darren Beale and they formed the act Cochine. In 1999 the first Cochine track Yes Man got released via Breakbeat Culture Records. But the big breakthrough for Cochine came one year later in the year 2000 when they released the track Hide You. It became a top 10 hit in lots of different countries and besides a club hit, it was a popular track on radio as well. In the UK, Hide You became the best single at the Drum and Bass Awards in the year 2001. After the release of Hide You, Cochine had several other hits with tracks such as Catch, Slip and Slide, Suicide, Hungry and All In My Head for example. Besides her work for Cochine, Sean did lots of collaborations with people such as Roger Shah, Paul Hazendonk, Jody Westernoff, She Kane, and perhaps her most well known track is Louder, for which she worked together with DJ Fresh. Cochine officially disbanded in 2016, but Sean and her band are still active with touring. Right before their last show from their Dutch tour, I sat down with Sean to ask her about the story behind Hide You and more. My first question to her was at what age she became interested in music? Music's been my life since I was a child. You know, my family were musicians. Um, my mother was a singer. <clears throat> my grandfather was a, a composer and a conductor of the male voice choirs in, in the Welsh Valleys, which is uh, a working class um, culture, really, in Wales. You know, there's church singing, the pub singing, choir singing, uh, rugby singing. Yeah. You know, so there was a lot of music. Singing. It's always yeah, always yeah. music. Okay. My mother had a beautiful voice. Yeah. <clears throat> and my grandfather um, tried to teach me to play piano and other instruments. I was such a daydreamer that he couldn't teach me. Yeah. So eventually they allowed me to sing. Yeah. And I'm grateful for that because he showed me how. Yeah, yeah. So do you remember some of the artists that you did listen to back then? I listened, when I was a child, I listened to whatever music was playing in the house. And my mum loved um, rock and roll and um, Barbara Streisand and uh, some of the old jazz legends and my dad liked classical music yeah, yeah. and it, I think he was probably depressive actually because he used to listen to big Tchaikovsky and mm -hmm. Bach and and uh, on his own in the front room but you'd listen to it and it was kind of dramatic but between him and, and, and my mum with her Mark Bolan phase, I think they kind of carved a lot of my influences, yeah. yeah. So, so I found Joni Mitchell and oh, Carly yeah. Simon and James Taylor and kind of tune in, drop out, hippie. Mm -hmm. um, I left home very early, so I was hanging out with lots of lots of hippies and yeah. in squats and yeah. stuff. So, communes. So did, did, did you ever get like singing lessons or yeah from your grand from my grandfather yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, besides that no 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 lessons I did I had a few lessons in the Welsh College of Music and Drama when I was young quite young they took me on uh, because I had a potential and I was training to sing in opera but my father found a packet of fags in my school bag and that was the end of that <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, sometimes I listen to these pure, powerful, incredible instruments of the opera singers and think, could that have been me? But I don't think I would have been able to express myself so much as I have if I would have been that restricted with, with training. And I'm quite a rebel, really, so I don't know whether that would have lasted very long. Maybe this is a better career for you. It's, it is what it is, yeah, and, yeah. and I'm loving it still, so... That's the most important. There you go. Yeah. So yeah, for this interview we're going to talk about uh, Hide You by Cochine, a track that came out as a double A-side alongside the track uh, Empty Skies. So yeah, Cochine was a project from yourself together with Mark Morrison and Darren Beale, uh, aka Decoder and Substance. Um, first things first, uh, how did you all got to meet? 
I was quite persistent. <clears throat> I was a, a young mum and I'd just landed in Bristol and I came to Bristol specifically to get involved with the Bristol music scene. Um, I was living in a teepee on the, on the top of a mountain and I think that my people that I lived with and the sheep and the animals were fed up of me singing them songs so I wanted to bring them to the city. <clears throat> Um, my son was, uh, my son's father was in Bristol as well, so it kind of worked out and I just relentlessly tried to get a gig with as many people as possible, get my voice heard and eventually um, Mark offered me, you know, a session in his studio and so we, I was surprised, you know, <clears throat> I didn't think that, because I knew his music, I didn't think that I was going to be able to connect with it so much, but he came through with quite a lot of melodic and orchestral kind of and string based stuff which I immediately connected with and we started to carve um, some songs which I'm passionate about songs. Yeah. Songs are everything to me, you know. You can tell you know, my influences, Johnny Mitchell, James Taylor, Carly Simon, the, they're song writers, you know, and they tell stories with their songs. Yeah. So that was I needed to do that. I was never going to be a, a baby, baby, yeah, yeah, vocalist. Yeah, yeah, indeed, yeah. So yeah, after the single "Say Yes Man" and "Dangerous Waters" from 1999, the track "Hide You" came out in the year 2000. Uh, do you still remember something from the writing process of "Hide You"? Absolutely, yeah. Clear as a bell. The boys were having a chili eating competition because that's what they did. They just horsed around a lot, and they had this loop playing. Doom, 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 doom. And I don't like eating chilies so much. And if they, if I had, there'd be no singing. You know, there would have been any, there, there wouldn't have been any voice if I'd have eaten the chilies they were eating. And they're like, literally, like, eat this one. It's really nice. And I don't, no, I don't want it. And they're like, ah, eating these chilies. They're such, they were such children. I mean, we were all kids, really. We were playing. That's the wonderful thing about music. It allows you to still maintain that childlike wonderment and horseplay so yeah so I just dropped on the mic and started to sing this mantra and they were like what press record they literally dived across the studio and donk press record and there you have it that's it I mean they were often they 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 wanted to try and make me change it up and verse chorus it but it it was just what it was yeah a simple mantra yeah, it just came like out of the blue and... Which has given it so many different, um, like you were saying about, you know, very course, the, the guy that did the, the remixes of it. There's, we've had loads of remixes of it, mm -hmm. and hundreds in yeah. fact, because I insisted on putting an a cappella version on the record so that we could have, and we have, to, still to this day people are throwing remixes mm -hmm. of me from that a cappella that we had on the vinyl. Yeah. So yeah, the, the instrumental was completely finished already when you when you started singing on it, or was it just like this this tiny loop? I told you, it's just a loop, and it still is. There's fuck all else there. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's it's like a it's, it's a bit of a simple song, but because of the simplicity, it's it's it, yeah. That's it's, exactly what yeah, I said. Exactly, that's why it became a hit, I guess. Versatility. So um, yeah, was it difficult to find a, a label for the track? The label found us. You know, the the internet was young. The Napster was young, it was all very young right then. And uh, the white label got about and a lot of people heard it, a lot of people liked it, a lot of people remixed it. So it took a few remixes, I think, to actually get it released. Yeah. Um, we went with a label called Moksha, um, run by a guy called Charles Kosh. And it was, yeah, I think, we got strung up a little bit there, but it happens yeah. with young bands. Yeah, you know, just, read the small print. Yeah, you're just happy you can. You can we're just happy we can get it out. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hear that pretty often. Mm. Yeah. But then that was then licensed to a major, which really because I think when you listened to when whoever listened to what we had in the bank, you know, it wasn't just hide you. It was the catch was already there. Empty Skies was already there. You know, we were really building this new kind of flavor in a way that wasn't so much drum and bass, that was song based. 
which was my heart. Yeah. You know? yeah. So yeah, at first uh, Haiju made it to the number 73 position of the UK singles chart, but in other countries uh, such as here in the Netherlands and also in Belgium, it was a top five hit. And in Greece and Romania, Haiju became a number one single in the charts. Yeah. Uh, were you guys surprised by the success? Absolutely. And the thing is, <clears throat> it was the John Creamer remix yeah. really that that took it from number 75, which was an outsider, to the top five in the UK. So it we you know it needed a different flavor. Drum and bass was still very underground at this point. I think we were the first um, drum and bass act to have a daytime rotation yeah. on Radio One. That's pretty cool. It was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. But again, that's the voice. Yeah. You know, the, the voice and the, the, the emotion with the song. People needed that. There was a lot of electronic music all the way from through the 90s, a lot of electronic music. And I think the human ear needs to feel a soul and needs to feel a, a connection. And that the voice just does it. You know, yeah. Does it for me anyway. Yeah. Not just my voice, obviously, but you know, that's what I'm attracted to. I resonate with that. So yeah, I already said like the, the, the first version uh, made it to the number 73 position of the UK. But yeah, later you guys decided to re-release it, I, I guess because in other countries it was... It was a remix. That was the remix. Yes, yes, yeah, that, that was that went all across America as well, yeah, yeah. And then which it, was great. You know, that, that really gave us a springboard. We were taken extremely seriously then yeah. and invested in. Uh, and that, you know, that carved us. And it was the beginning of the end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, the 2001 version that, that released, the, the, the new remix, made it to the number six position of the UK chart. Uh, and I think then Koshin was invited to uh, perform at Top of the Pops. We did Top of the Pops twice. Yeah. Yeah. Were you nervous? We did Top of the Pops here as well. Oh, in the Netherlands? Yes. Ah. That's who I was talking about last ah. night, the guy that, that I recognize. I've got such a brilliant memory mm -hmm. for faces and for energies and for peoples. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't remember names. I can hardly remember the names of uh, my own kids. <laughs> you know, but um, I'm terrible with birthdays. But um, yeah, it was it was amazing actually, and to, it's a historical thing because there is no top of the pops anymore. No, no. So to actually have been on top of the pops was quite big for us. Yeah, and we did lots of kids shows and stuff like that, and breakfast telly, and I didn't think that, that was where we should be, but. We did it. Yeah, probably the label wanted to promote the track. Of course they did. They didn't really know what to do with us. You know, we were an enigma in a, in a lot of ways because we weren't <clears throat> we weren't pigeonhole a ball. We couldn't be pigeonholed because we kept moving the boundaries a little bit. And maybe that was part of the reason why we we didn't continue and write more albums. Or, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of reasons why that that happened. We didn't get we didn't have management. Um, and we were a bunch of wild kids, you know. So yeah, do you, do you have any idea how many copies have been sold of Haiju like during the years? Not a clue. I don't do numbers. No. Okay. So yeah. I'm uh, just grateful to still be able to yeah. be yeah. out on the road and yeah. still being asked to collaborate with some amazing artists, mm -hmm. writing songs for amazing people. Yeah. I'm just so proud of that and humbled by it, really. Yeah. I've always had my feet on the ground. I've never really courted the celebrity status. It wasn't really my bag. I'm very, you know, working class Welsh girl. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not in your nature. It's not in my nature. No. no. So yeah, we're recording this interview in Tilburg, which will be the last show of your Dutch tour. Um, how is it to be back on tour now that things are getting back, yeah, a bit back normal, uh, to normal after the pandemic? It's lovely. What can I say? You know, it was devastating for artists. Devastating. You know, you don't know how much a part of your um, identity is linked to that simple act of performance, you know? Mm -hmm. And it pushed me to my paces. Yeah. I'd recently moved back, my marriage broke down, so I moved back to Bristol, to my house in Bristol. And <clears throat> I was all ready to, yeah, let's embrace Bristol. And then, yeah. shut down. Oh. So. I had to really, it was very challenging for my mental health and, but, you know, I was also quite surprised at how resilient and how adaptable and, and how much I really do know myself. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't write anything. I thought, yep, this is it. I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write another album, I'm going to sit down and write loads of stuff. Write a word, not a word. Yeah, so like I just went through everything in my head and, you know, I have two dogs, and 
And it was just very much about slowing down, taking a step back. Up until that point, I think my life had been moving very, very quickly for a very long, very long time. And uh, I, my life's changed since since the pandemic. Yeah, I, I'm a different woman. I like me. Yeah. Well, that, that's good. <laughs> so we have a lot of gigs uh, coming up now in the summer. A handful, a good, a good handful, enough to keep me busy. Yeah. I also, I got uh, in during the pandemic. I sold my house in Bristol. I thought I can't fucking stay here anymore because mm -hmm. I can't even go out. So we sold up and I bought a house by the sea, and I do bed and breakfast. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> Which is lovely. It's a bit like performing because upstairs is where the guests are. Mm -hmm. I have two rooms only. And I do fab fab I love cooking. Yeah. Cooking and making music is quite similar. It's all about balance mm -hmm. and taste. Um, so that's, you know, <laughs> and downstairs it's a chaos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Upstairs it's high. Yeah. <laughs> How would you like your eggs? This yeah. 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 Great. So, because I saw like, I'm not sure what was your, your Instagram. I saw like uh, in the, like the sea and you were like walking with the dogs. I'm and, always walking with yeah. my dogs. That's my, my that's what keeps yeah. my, yeah. my head together yeah. really. So, um, yeah, are there any countries you would still love to perform, but where you've never been yet? I don't think we've, I think we've been pretty much everywhere. Not been to, yeah, I've been to Iceland. I've been, not been to Hawaii. Oh. <laughs> so if promoters from Hawaii are watching this interview, <laughs> then uh, they can email you. So yeah, you're not only known as the I wife. just want to keep going. Yeah. You know, I, like I said, during the pandemic, you realize how much it means to you to perform and getting back on the stage. And it means a lot to the people that are interested still to come and see us. You know, you can see the joy in their, in their faces. You can feel the relief that they can let go again. They can be amongst yeah. other people and they can enjoy themselves in a group. It's an mm -hmm. important part of our human psyche, I think, to be in a group. Yeah. I think the crowd is appreciating like live shows more now. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe we got a little complacent, a little yeah. bit spoiled, a little yeah. bit kind of blase. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you're not only known as the writer and vocalist of Cochin. Uh, in 2011, you had a number one hit in the UK single chart with the track Louder, which was a collaboration with uh, DJ Fresh. Is, is that your biggest hit so far? Uh, I, uh, I know you don't do numbers, but... I don't do numbers. <laughs> it's great though. Yeah, yeah. I still love that song. I wrote some other bits and pieces and I've written for Rita Ora and I think Hot Right Now went across the Atlantic. I think that did possibly better than Louder, I'm not yeah. sure. But, you know, Louder is an anthem of our time. Yeah. I think it will stand the test of time. A bit like Hide You, a bit like Catch, you know, it's got that, that emotion in it that just says, yes, we, we are gonna be stronger, we're positive, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're loud and proud yeah. and individual and united together in that. Yeah. It's great. So yeah, you also work together with other artists such as uh, Roger Shah, uh, Jody Westenhoff from Way Out West, uh, the Stanton Warriors, uh, Headhunters, and last year a cool new version of Hide You was released together with uh, Dutch duo Tin Um Are there still people you would love to work with? I still want to work with Massive Attack. I, I mean, I worked, I, I moved to Bristol to work with Massive Attack, <laughs> and they've never been interested in me oh. whatsoever. <laughs> Meh, not for the want of trying. Yeah. I mean, I used to live around the corner from Daddy G and we'd chat in the, in the same corner uh -huh. shop and occasionally smoke a giant or have a drink together, uh -huh. but... Maybe one day. Some things never, some things are not meant to be. <laughs> Maybe one day. So yeah, what are you working on right now? Um, right now, um, I'm just gonna get through these last, well, this last gig. It's been four gigs, it's quite strenuous. I turned 50 in October, so um, I'm not as bouncy as I used to be. Uh, I'm, I'm working with a producer called Sakura, who is an incredible woman. And uh, we've got some, some tracks that we've written that I'm very excited about, although we're waiting for the right home for them to place them. She's got an incredible journey. I, I can't speak about it, but I think if you check, check her out, the story will, will come through and, and you'll be very impressed. What kind of genre is it? It's drum and bass. Drum and bass, yeah. yeah. Ah, cool. So is there still something on your bucket list, music-wise, besides the track with uh, Massive I want to I want to finish the musical that I'm writing. Oh, um, that's cool. Yeah, I'm very much into um, singing therapy. I teach and I coach and I get a lot of pleasure from that. 
um, I'd maybe like to work with, I've done a lot of youth work and a lot of work with young offenders and, and kids that have lost their confidence, working through the, the medium of, of the voice. You know, a lot of the time we're told to shut up, shut up, shut up so much that we, our voices disappear inside mm. us. And then we, then we get aggressive or unhappy because we don't have a voice. So pulling the voice forward and, and using the voice yeah. can enable us to express I mean, our voice. That's what it's there for. It's, to, it's a tool to express our needs. Yeah. You know, but we use when we when we're kids, babies, feed me. You know, so it's a it's a beautiful journey when you set someone off on that journey of discovering their voice. It's really something else. You know, it unlocks a lot of emotional tension. That's something I'm very keen on. I'd also, I've, I've recently decided that I would like to, um, I'd like to maybe, I, this is gonna sound crazy. I'd like to be a celebrant. <laughs> like to marry people. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> you're, you're busy. You're, you're busy. I know, that, yeah, that. we've got to have another hour in the day for yeah. us. But when we've got one more hour in the day, then I'll, I'll study and I'll be a, a celebrant. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> it's crazy, right? Yeah. Burying people and marrying them and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, let's see. And the last question, pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Absolutely, yes. Yes, good, good. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time and good luck with everything. You're welcome, thank you. All right, that was it. This week's vlog, my interview with Sean Evans and the story behind Koshin's Hide You. Sean, thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the vlog. If you did, make sure to give this video a like, leave a comment in the comment section below, and very important, make sure to subscribe. Also make sure to click the bell button because then you will get a notification the next time a new vlog is online. Once again, thanks for watching and until next time, bye bye.